Hi, this is Buriana. Welcome to my channel Art Unplugged. When you're looking at a painting like this, your first thought is probably, hmm, this is weird, but then so beautifully painted, but weird. But look how beautiful it's been painted and so on. Hmm? Welcome to the weird and beautifully painted world of Salvador Dali. Greetings! 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 For weird, you can substitute the word surreal. And when we talk about surrealism, the first name that springs to mind is that of Salvador Dali. And this is not only because of the unsettling magnetism and mastery of his art, but also because of his reputation for clownish exhibitionism, narcissism and a superinflated ego. I'm still talking about Salvador Dali, right? Who, sir, is the greatest living painter in the world? Uh, today, Dali. His life is everything that makes for a juicy story. Talent, glamour, love, money, sexual perversity, politics, religion, even fraud. So, who was Salvador Dali? A genius or a clown? Let's see. Dali was born in 1889 in Figueres, a small town near Barcelona, to a prosperous middle-class family. Dali grew up in an overprotected environment and he was allowed to do whatever he wanted. So no wonder that he became a spoiled, obstinate child prone to tantrums. And as often happens in such cases, he grew up a narcissist expecting others to behave towards him the way his parents did. In 1922, Dali enrolled in the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Madrid, where he joined a group of leading artistic personalities that included filmmaker Luis Buñuel and the poet Federico García Lorca, with whom Dali would develop a very close and passionate friendship shrouded in homosexual mystery. At this period, Dali, already a young adult, was demonstrating his flamboyant and provocative persona. His eccentricity was notorious and originally more renowned than his artwork. Eventually, in 1926, he was expelled from the academy for insulting one of his professors. Artistically, Dali was influenced by many styles of art, ranging from the most academically classic to the most cutting-edge avant-garde. His classical influences inf included Raphael, Zurbaran, Vermeer and Velázquez. In his early years, he experimented with Impressionism, Pointillism and Cubist techniques. A few months after his expulsion, Dali went to Paris, where he developed an interest in psychoanalysis and soon attracted the interest of the Surrealists. Surrealism is an artistic movement directly influenced by Freudian psychoanalysis. Surrealists believed that the rational mind repressed the power of the imagination and turned to the subconscious for inspiration. Dali developed his own system of tapping into the subconscious, which he called paranoiac critical method, a state in which one could be delusional and sane at the same time. Paranoiac critical method, because it's one spontaneous method of knowledge based in the instantaneous association of delirious material. He claimed that his art was the meticulous representations of dreams or apparitions, sometimes resulting from staring at an object for a long time. Alongside his apparitions and images streamed from the subconscious, Dali's work is rife with symbolism ranging from fetishes and animal imagery to religious symbols. Dali considered himself a genius and never tired of talking about it. His arrogance and hyperinflated ego caused his peers to gradually distance themselves from him and eventually turned him into a laughingstock. 
When Dali was a young boy, his father exposed him to a book illustrating the horrific effects of venereal disease, which caused traumatic associations of sex with morbidity and rot in his mind. This left him with a lifelong pathological sexual anxiety. As a consequence, Dali's work is permeated by obsessive themes of eroticism, death and decay, drawing on his childhood memories and lifelong fears and obsessions. Needless to say, the Dali phenomenon, his artwork and his behavior have always been of interest to psychiatrists. For those of you who are interested, I have included a link to a very interesting article in the description below. Dali followed the scientific discoveries of the 20th century with vivid interest, and many of them appeared as themes in his paintings. In a typical Dalinian fashion, he declared that his famous work, The Persistence of Memory, is an anticipation of quantum physics. And Camembert cheese. In the moment of pain, my soul watches. Is the more rigid object for everybody, and myself paint his watches, the Zenka, very soft Camembert. Everybody laughed. The last development of nuclear physics proved that the new conception of space time is completely flexible. Not only it is in the microphysics, the time board in reverse. This proved that this object of completely surrealistic approach of Solvatger is completely true and scientific. So how did a wacko like this become the richest and possibly one of the most successful artists of the 20th century? To answer this question, we need to go back to his life story, because now things are getting interesting. In August 1929, Dali met his lifelong muse and future wife, Gala. Born Elena Ivanovna Diakonova in 1894 in Russia, she was given the nickname Gala by Paul Eluard, who was her first husband and her first creative muse project. Gala was cultured, emancipated, materialistic and a nymphomaniac. She and Eluard lived in an open marriage. Eluard took pleasure in introducing Gala to new lovers, including the artist Marx Ernst, who left his family and lived with a couple in a menage a trois for a couple of years. Later, Gallo will seduce Ernst's teenage son too. A number of major creative people were smitten by her, yet many who met her described her as difficult and demanding. In 1929, Gallo and Eluard traveled to Dali's home in Kadekes to spend the summer. There, Gallo started an affair with Dali, who was 10 years younger. The affair led to marriage which lasted until her death, 53 years. It is really hard to imagine how this woman would fall for the eccentric, skinny young man with his bursts of hysterical laughter, his lavatorial humor and messed up sexuality. Dali himself claimed many times that he was a virgin when he met Gala and that they never had normal sex together. No wonder that the painting, which marks the beginning of the love of his life, is titled The Great Master Beta. But Gala left her husband and traded her chic Parisian apartment for a primitive stone hut in the Catalonian village of Portligat. Gala, who at the time called him my dear boy, became a strange mix of muse, mother, dominatrix and manager, steering Dali's career with calculating mind and a firm hand. She was both the inspiration of the artist and the handler of the clown. And though she went along with his extravagances and took part in his bizarre performances, one thing is certain, at all times Gala had her head firmly screwed on. Some historians see Gala more as a collaborator than a muse. Dali painted her repeatedly over the years, and it is very difficult to imagine a passive Gala just sitting in a chair and obeying Dali as he tells her where to put herself or what to wear. And an evidence of her role is that very often he signed his work as Gala Salvador Dali. To escape the Second World War, they traveled to New York in the 1930s, where they became an immediate hit with the collectors and the press. Dali came to be seen as the mad surrealist par excellence, 
and the mysterious Gala, his aloof and glamorous muse. They spent the 40s in America too, fraternizing with Walt Disney and Alfred Hitchcock, with Dali making a living by painting surrealist portraits of millionaires, and Gala acting as his agent. In America, Dali would do anything that would make him money, from designing magazine covers, jewelry fashion, furniture, to TV commercials. <laughs> Je suis fou du chocolat landais. Much to the scorn of his surrealist peers, who gave him the anagramic nickname Ave the Dollars, based on his name. In her greed, Gala would not stop short of fraud, currency smuggling, tax evasion, and forgery. She carried suitcases full of undeclared cash on flights and traveled from Paris to New York to deposit checks in the bank in order to avoid Spanish tax authorities. When they returned to Spain in 1949, Dali sided with the dictator General Franco, as a result of which many considered him a sellout and a traitor. Back in Port Ligat, he turned to religious painting, glorifying the divine majesty of the Catholic faith, with Gala as his model. To be dismissed once again, a shameless publicity seeker by the surrealists and the followers of modern art. In 1960, Dali was considered by many an irrelevant clown. In 1969, Dali bought for Gala a derelict castle at Pubol, which they refurbished together as a surrealist stage set. From then on, Gala would live there till the end of her life, entertaining a string of young lovers. Dali would be permitted to visit only with her written invitation. Even now in her 70s, Gala continued to spend tens of thousands of dollars on her young gigolos. But the best paintings she sold were dead then. She had sold them herself, some for pittance, and even given a few of Dali's masterpieces to her lovers. She worried about money, which drove her into the corruption of his last years the genuine signatures which he put on paintings that were not his, on forgeries that she had secretly commissioned from imitators, or on blank sheets of paper which would be later used for fake prints, estimated between 50 and 100,000 forgeries. This dealt a very heavy blow on Dali's reputation. Gala died in 1987, and Dali survived her by seven miserable years. Opinions about the Dali phenomenon are divided, but nobody doubts the decisive role of Gala in it. My view is that he was an exceptionally talented but deeply disturbed man, who became the material in the hands of a very intelligent, crafty and ambitious woman, who turned him into the first artistic brand. With all that goes in it, top quality product, a legend around it, celebrity endorsement, even brand extensions. A perfect money machine. So this is Gala's legacy. She created the new breed of artist millionaire at the price of his artistic and personal integrity. The precursor of the Jeff Koons and Damien Hirsts of today. Is this a good thing? You tell me. As for Dali the painter, as the most prominent among the Surrealists, he inspired many artists after him to turn into their subconscious for inspiration. Also, he proved that the painterly tradition of the old masters is perfectly compatible with modernism, something which is very important from a historical point of view. Six pigs, pigs, pigs. <laughs> I hope you found this video interesting. Please give it a like, share, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you very soon. Bye.